Tonight, Trump abandons the AIDS crisis, India's war against cash, and... I've sat in this chair pondering sometimes, do I like unicorn sparkle or do I like sparkle unicorn? House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and Representative James Clyburn called on Congressman John Conyers to resign after multiple women accused him of sexual misconduct. Both had initially questioned the veracity of the claims. But this morning on NBC, former Conyers aide Marion Brown, who was fired in 2015 and received a settlement, publicly detailed the inappropriate behavior for the first time, saying Conyers, quote, violated my body. The calls also came shortly after it was revealed that the 88-year-old, who served in Congress since 1965, has been hospitalized. Conyers denied any wrongdoing, and his spokesman says he has no plans to resign. Nancy Pelosi did not elect the congressman, and she sure as hell won't be the one to tell the congressman to leave. Russell Simmons is stepping down from his companies following a sexual assault allegation. Screenwriter Jenny Lumet said Simmons forced her to have sex in 1991. The music and TV producer and co-founder of Def Jam Recordings said he remembers their encounter differently, but apologized and said Lumet's, quote, feelings of fear and intimidation are real. Lumet said it was Simmons' denial of another allegation of sexual assault by model Carrie Clausen Kaligi that prompted her to reveal her own incident. At a summit in the Ivory Coast, the European Union, United Nations, and African Union agreed to an emergency plan to help evacuate migrants held in Libyan detention camps. Most will be returned to their countries of origin. They also pledged to dismantle smuggling networks. The ambitious plan came after a disturbing CNN report that appeared to show migrants being sold as slaves by smugglers. Libya's UN-backed government has said it will grant international organizations access to the centers. Italy's former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi has been ordered to stand trial for bribing a witness. The charges stem from a previous 2013 trial, in which he was accused of paying for sex with an underage dancer and using his power to conceal it. The 81-year-old was eventually acquitted in that case. The new trial will begin in February, just as Berlusconi was trying to mount a political comeback. Last week, he asked the European Court of Human Rights to reverse a ruling banishing him from public office. Former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort could soon be released from house arrest after reaching a deal with special counsel Robert Mueller's office. The $11 million bail agreement stipulates that Manafort will forfeit four of his properties if he violates the conditions of his release. The judge still has to approve the bail, which would also free Manafort from GPS monitoring. Manafort has been under house arrest since last month, when he and his business partner Rick Gates were indicted on charges including money laundering and conspiracy. Since the 90s, you've been able to visit the Office of National AIDS Policy site on the White House homepage. On it, you found detailed information about the president's efforts to combat the HIV AIDS crisis. This was Bill Clinton's page. This was George W. Bush's page. This was Barack Obama's page. And this is President Trump's. And it fell to the best of my when President Trump was sworn in, the HIV AIDS community worried it had a new political crisis on its hands. Here's why. He didn't say anything about HIV during the campaign. He didn't meet with activists before the election. And among his first order of business was pushing a budget and a health care plan that called for deep cuts to the government programs that fight HIV AIDS inside the United States. This is a repeal and a replace of Obamacare. Make no mistake about it. The debate about what to do next played out among members of the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. The volunteer group of scientists and public health experts was created by Bill Clinton to help steer policy on the disease at the Department of Health and Human Services. We're here because we remain committed as a collective to eradicating HIV and AIDS. Pacha was designed to give HIV AIDS activists a direct line into the U.S. government. Gabriel Maldonado and Scott Shadis were both appointed during the Obama years. Watching Trump for a few months, Scott decided to quit very publicly. He took five other members with him. The tipping point for me was how the president was handling healthcare reform. 
that it was all a game, that it was all about striking a deal. What did you think leaving Pacha would accomplish? It brought you? attention to this issue. We haven't been talking about HIV AIDS in this country. And within the context of this healthcare reform debate, I wanted to remind people that there was this epidemic still going on among certain groups within the United States. Unlike Scott, Gabriel decided to remain a member of Pacha, even with Trump in the White House. I am a black, brown, gay man in America, and I just have to be here. I have to be present. I have to be a voice. I actually think that I do a better service to my community staying in the room. Both of these men do not think the Trump administration cares that much about HIV AIDS. We asked the White House about this, and an official pointed us to the hiring of a woman respected by HIV AIDS activists as the president's domestic health policy advisor. But the only headlines she's made have been about contraception, which she says is dangerous. So activists are on solid ground when they say the domestic HIV AIDS fight doesn't seem like a priority for this president. But does that matter? Dr. Anthony Fauci has been a lead government scientist on infectious diseases since the earliest days of HIV AIDS. He's done his work under every president elected since 1980. Over the last 35 and a half years of which I've had the honor and the privilege of being involved in this endeavor, there have been breathtaking advances. We have been fortunate in that from the standpoint of the kind of things that I do with biomedical research, developing therapies, developing a vaccine, we have been well supported, almost regardless of whether or not a particular administration is much more enthusiastic about getting involved or not. What you're saying is the work that you do is sort of administration proof? I wouldn't say administration proof. I, I'm saying that it, it tends to get rescued when there is a lack of, of uh, active uh, support for something. Political power amassed by HIV AIDS activists over decades means funding research and prevention is not controversial anymore. Cutting it is. The Trump administration's proposed budget cuts nearly 20% to the CDC prevention and NIH research programs devoted to HIV AIDS. But the Republican-led Congress doesn't include those cuts in its budget. Meanwhile, Fauci presses on in work that has helped to lead to massive improvements for the lives of people infected with HIV. A 20-year-old diagnosed in the 1980s, before antiretroviral therapies came online, could expect to live just one or two years. But with today's treatments, that same 20-year-old could expect to live another 53 years. Scientific gains have been rapid, and the American HIV crisis has faded from the headlines. But there is still a crisis, and it's now a minority health crisis. Black and Hispanic Americans contract the virus at a significantly higher rate than white Americans. And black and Latino people who contract HIV in the United States die at a much higher rate than white people. This is why Gabe is still a member of Pacha. The same things I am saying about um, the need for addressing disparities amongst black gay men, amongst my black transgender sisters, amongst the Latino communities, has been consistent. Previous administration, this administration, and I will be saying the exact same thing in the many years to come. Inside the U.S., HIV AIDS activists feel abandoned by this White House. But some say that might not be a bad thing. At this point, I would rather this president not pay attention. Because when I've seen the president pay attention on other issues, it goes in a direction that I usually don't agree with. So in many respects, I would say, you know what? Fine. Like, stop. Don't. Don't start paying attention to HIV, and the work will continue, as, as we've been talking about, in ways that are beneficial. We're also going to eliminate tax breaks and complex loopholes taken advantage of by the wealthy. Who are they? I don't know. I think my accountants are going crazy right now. It's all right. Hey, look, I'm president. I don't care. I don't care anymore. I don't care. That was President Trump yesterday saying that the tax reform package speeding its way through Congress is a loser for him and other wealthy folks. But will Donald Trump and by extension other really, really rich people really suffer for the tax code changes he's proposing? Since my dad, Walter Thomas CPA, still does my taxes, I went to talk to Brian Galley at Georgetown to figure this out. I think his accountant is telling him, remember all that tax planning that we did over the years to minimize the amount of taxes that you're paying, well, we're going to have to throw that out 
But don't worry, there's another huge gift for you in this new piece of legislation that's going to be worth three or four times as much as you were saving before. Since the tax rate for all income tax brackets goes down in the Senate tax plan, the president would obviously benefit. But the rate doesn't actually drop that much for people who make over a million dollars per year. So that isn't where he's getting his real savings. Also, people have pointed to the two pages of Trump's 2005 tax return that are actually public to show how much more he paid in taxes due to the alternative minimum tax. The tax legislation does away with this tax altogether. That might benefit the president, but it is unclear if he ends up having to pay the AMT every year. If he does that on a regular basis, it's a good thing for him. Now here's where the real savings start to play out for someone like Trump when you start talking about changing the tax rate for pass-through businesses. Now, under the current law, pass-throughs are companies that don't pay corporate income taxes, but instead pay at the individual income tax rate of the owner or the owners of the company. Sometimes these are small businesses, sometimes these are multi-million dollar businesses like Donald Trump's. He's looking at the ability to reduce his tax rate on $150 million annually in income from about 40% down to somewhere between 25 and 31%. If you do the math, that's probably somewhere between 12 and $20 million a year. And there's the estate tax. That's the tax your estate pays when you die if you are incredibly rich. Right now, your heirs only pay that tax if you leave behind an estate worth more than $5.49 million. Married couples can leave behind twice that without paying anything. The Senate doubles those exemptions, so Brian thinks that means Trump's kids would save somewhere between four and $6 million when he dies. Now, the thing I thought might hurt Trump a bit is the change in how people can deduct their state and local property taxes from their federal taxes, especially since he files taxes in New York, which is a high property tax state. The House puts a cap on that deduction. The Senate does away with it for now. What I didn't know before talking to Brian is that Trump's businesses will still be able to benefit fully from this deduction. Corporations can still deduct their state and local taxes. You and I can't. So President Trump, does he benefit? or no. On one side of his balance sheet, he might be giving up a tax dodge that's currently worth a few million dollars to him. But on the other side of the ledger, he's getting many, many millions more than that in other benefits, and his heirs are getting a huge win. In November 2016, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced that he was immediately banning the use of the two most common banknotes, which meant taking 86% of the country's currency out of circulation overnight. To break the grip of corruption and black money, we have decided that the 500 rupee and 1000 rupee currency notes will no longer be legal tender from midnight to night. The move led to long lines outside banks and lots of criticism that Modi seriously damaged the economy. But today, his government had some reason to celebrate, as the latest GDP figures showed growth picking up again after a downward slide that started last year. Vice News went to India to see how Modi's economic gamble is paying off. India is in the middle of a massive socioeconomic transformation and it's been making a huge push to turn its cash-based economy into a digital one. They will take your thumb, they will take your iris, because it has to be unique, right? Your iris or your thumb, I cannot misuse. You come here, give all your details, and in two minutes, your bank account is generated. At this processing center in Mumbai, people are signing up to enter the National Electronic Database, known as Aadhaar. It's the Hindi word for foundation. Aadhaar is basically unique identification okay. given by government of India to its citizen. This government is pushing this Aadhaar scheme very hard. So they're trying to basically get everyone in India's fingerprints Correct. and Correct. iris ID. Correct. Does Correct. any other country do this? Is this something? I don't think so. Really? Only India is doing this. It seems pretty radical. Yeah. Registering with Aadhaar used to be voluntary, but Modi has pushed people to join by making enrollment mandatory for a number of basic transactions like filing taxes, signing up for government benefits, purchasing anything over the equivalent of about $770, and opening a bank account. But Aadhaar isn't only about streamlining personal finance. It's also about formalizing the economy and giving the government a way to increase tax revenue. You can now use this data 
to identify as larger enterprises, larger individuals who should have been paying taxes other than the purely criminal part of it, who have not. The number of individuals who submit income tax returns is of the order of 45 million. 45 million might sound like a lot, but with a population of over one and a quarter billion, that means that just 3.5% of Indians pay taxes. But since India started digitizing with Aadhaar in 2009, its tax collection has more than doubled. Modi says there's another reason for the increase in tax collection, his signature demonetization policy, which forced people to hand over huge amounts of currency to the banks last year. What has happened as a result is that virtually all the cash that was outside the banking system has come back into the banking system. Although this worked in bringing the general public into the system, it failed to eradicate one of India's biggest problems, black money, cash that's not declared for tax purposes. Much of these funds flow through a word of mouth parallel banking system known as Hawala. It works like this. If someone in Mumbai wants to get money to his brother in Delhi, he goes to his local Hawala broker and gives him rupees for transfer. He pays a commission too, but it's still cheaper than a bank would charge. The Mumbai broker then calls another broker in Delhi, who delivers the agreed upon amount to the recipient, usually by the next day. About $1 trillion move through India this way a year. And since Hawala brokers work outside the official monetary system, all that black money is non-taxable and essentially untraceable. People who had black money found ingenious ways in which to exchange it. I mean, they were one step ahead of the government. Mm -hmm. They found ways in which the black money could be converted to white money. Did the Prime Minister betray the public trust? Absolutely, because he sent millions of people into misery. But is there some wisdom in being bold? Nothing is wrong in being bold. But uh, at the same time, you don't have a right to be reckless. Demonetization did have consequences. GDP growth rates slipped from 7.9% in the first quarter of 2016 to 5.7% in the first quarter of this year. But even with this slip, India's GDP growth rate is still 2.1% higher than the IMF's global growth rate projections. We should not try to gauge it in terms of a very narrow economics cost-benefit calculation. It wasn't about that. It was about a cleansing of the institutional system. The vendors in markets like this one, which are common across the country, were some of the hardest hit by the overnight removal of bills from circulation. But even they are now beginning to see trade bounce back. You only take cash in your transaction? So do you pay your suppliers in cash also? Yeah. When demonetization happened, what did it mean for your business? Last hmm? year, business is 50%. How much do you expect to sell today? It's 70%. 70% from your peak. Yeah. So the note bund still affects yeah. the business that you're doing. Yes. Yes. So even though it, hit, it, it took a toll on your business to the tune of 50%, you still think it's a good idea? It's good, but it uh, takes some time. During the dot-com era of the 90s, a simple domain name could sell for millions. But search engines have made prime URLs less important, and dot-com is just one of many IP address options. But now a new kind of domain name is up for grabs, and one man thinks it's his second shot at an internet gold rush. We process images so much faster than we do words. So I thought of the emojis, all of a sudden someone could own being happy or confused or silly or sunglasses. Paige Howe is like an internet real estate developer. And right now it's a buyer's market for emoji domains. Instead of having to give out a long domain name, mycompany.com slash, all of a sudden they can give out triple sunglasses, you know, which is the, the smiley with the sunglasses that really means cool. So all of a sudden you can say, we're triple cool. 
we're triple cool. And people think cool, 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 dot WS. And so uh, that's what I spend my day doing. Let's go, come on in. Come on. What is my most valuable emoji? We've got the, the two girls dancing, the party girl emoji, which I really like. We probably priced that one about $7,000 right now. You know how you hear stories about some guy in the 90s who bought McDonald's.com before McDonald's even knew there was an internet? And then that guy sold the domain back to McDonald's for like a zillion dollars? Well, Paige was one of those guys, though he bought generic words. Tell me about some of your successful URL sales. I've got two of the biggest sales of all time, which is seniors.com for 1.7 million, and then guy.com for a million dollars. Fast forward a couple decades and most of the good words are taken. You can't buy shit.com. That's a pornographic website that caters to adults with specific interests. But you can buy triple poo emoji.ws. So WS is for the island nation of Western Samoa. When they first gave out the internet, they said, okay, we're gonna give each country their own top level domain name. The country codes have more freedom of expression. They're not under the rules from this group called ICANN. ICANN is the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers, a nonprofit that makes the rules on internet infrastructure. Earlier this year, ICANN issued a warning against the use of emoji and domain names, in part because someone could fish people with homographs or similar looking emojis. But that hasn't stopped Paige from investing. So how do you figure out how much to sell an emoji domain for? So right now I'm literally making up the prices. I may say that I'm gonna sell my single characters for between four and $6,000. Now I have no basis to say that, which means it could be too high and it could be too low. Who do you imagine buying it? Anybody that Why? wants to start a conversation because okay. it, it put a smile on my face. Sometimes it's gonna be that person who comes in, somebody wanting to come in and have the taco. You know what I mean? And maybe they say, we're gonna use that to be a food delivery service that delivers tacos. I think that may be where some of my buyers come from more than the traditional companies. What's the most expensive emoji domain you've bought? About $1,000 for a single character. What was it? That was the alien emoji. That, that does seem like a cool one. We were able to get some neat ones like uh, sparkles and unicorn together. I just thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, wine and cheese together, uh, beer and pizza together. Does it matter what order the emojis are in? I've sat in this chair looking at this screen pondering sometimes, do I like unicorn sparkle or do I like sparkle unicorn? Which one did you go with? Unicorn sparkle. It just seemed like it was the unicorn needed to have the lead. At 54 years old, it's ESL for Paige. That's emoji as a second language. And sometimes he needs help with translation. Having a daughter who's 17 and another daughter who's 18, they keep me up to speed on how those emojis are used. Or, I hate to say it, if they're used for inappropriate things. They're your in-house teen consultants. So yeah, we learned a lot when we bought the sweat emoji. That what was we, that? Uh, it just seems to have a lot of meanings around the world. What, what are they? I, you know, I live here in a small town in Manchester, Tennessee, and my church elders would probably not be what me saying. So. What would you like to have for your own personal website? Like what emoji combination? Right now, probably gonna go with the triple cool because who doesn't wanna be triple cool? <laughs> and, and what's cool worth? We're still trying to figure it out. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, November 30th. 